There we go. Well, I'll make a start. So I'm probably best known for my work on marine mammals. So I use genetic approaches to understand, for instance, how populations of seals in the Antarctic are responding to climate change. But I've always been passionate about mushrooms, and eventually my curiosity got the better of me, and I decided that I had to start working on them. The talk today will be divided into three parts. In the first part, I want to talk about a small study of the population structure and genetic diversity of Belitis edulis around Bielefeld in northern Germany. In the second part, I want to provide a very brief outline of a project that's been funded by the German Science Foundation in collaboration with Fernando, working on the genomics of Belitis edulis. And then finally, I'd like to speculate on whether mushroom harvesting might have effects on the genetic diversity of mushrooms, and I'll mention some ways in which we might study that. So moving on to the first part, mushrooms have this unique life cycle, so the fruiting bodies or sporocarps produce spores which are dispersed passively by the wind or actively by animal vectors. These grow into hyphae and under certain conditions the hyphae fuse to form the mycelium which forms the bulk of the mushroom underground and produces the fruiting bodies in the mushroom season. But we still don't know very much about fundamental properties. So, for instance, how far do the spores disperse? And how does the mycelia grow? And how long does it live for? And answering these questions is vital to understanding the structure of fungal populations and their persistence. In essence, if the spores disperse a long way, this should lead to a mixing of the gene pool, so we should find no genetic differences over space. Whereas if, say, the majority of spores fall within a few metres of the sporocarp that produced them, then this should lead to fine-scale population structure. And this has been observed in several species, chanterelles being one example. But it gets more complicated because at the local level, population structure should reflect the balance between the local recruitment of spores, the longevity of the mycelium, and competition between different individuals. And studies have shown that older stands of trees often carry larger but fewer fungal clones. And so it's been argued that um, young sites are colonized by many individuals. These then compete with one another. And eventually, over time, this leads either to the selective mortality of some individuals or to the suppression of fruiting. So I come to the protagonist of the story now, and I'm sure many, if not all of you, are intimately familiar with this most beautiful and delectable mushroom, Belitis edulis. So it's, it's ecologically and commercially important. It has a broad geographic distribution across the Northern Hemisphere, where it's um, associated with a number of different tree species. And importantly, where it's found, it tends to be locally abundant. And this facilitates the sampling of the sporocarps over space and time. And so in Bielefeld, we identified 14 sites around the city. And all of these sites are within about five minute cycle of my house. So I can visit them between two and four times a week during the mushroom season. And this is what I did in 2015 when I started this study. What I also did is I went to these sites and I measured the circumference of all trees above 20 centimetres in diameter. And I fed these into a tree age calculator to estimate the age of these plots. And these plots are dominated by beech. And so I used genetic analysis, specifically microsatellites, to produce genetic profiles for all sporocarps. And the key point here is that any two individuals in a population, different individuals, have a probability of only three in a million of having the same genotype. So we can be very confident in identifying genetically distinct individuals or genets. So we identified 52 genets out of 134 sporocarps that we sampled, 
And this figure shows the distribution of genets and sporocarps across the study. So the um, sample sites are shown on the x-axis in descending order of the number of sporocarps, and then the sporocarps are assigned to genets which are delimited by these horizontal lines. And we found no relationship between the number of sporocarps and the number of genets. So in other words, more sporocarps doesn't necessarily mean more genets. Certain sites, like uh, site one here, were dominated by a small number of very highly productive individuals. So one genet produced 23 porcini mushrooms within this single season. Whereas other sites, like site two, had a much greater diversity of individuals but these were individually less productive. We found no evidence for population structure, but we did find evidence for a relatedness structure. So we calculated the relatedness between each pair of individuals based on the genetic data and expressed this as a heat map. So here you see the genets shown along the X and the Y axes, and every square represents a comparison between two individuals Light green squares represent unrelated individuals and dark blue represent closely related individuals. And what you can see is that certain sites, in particular this highly diverse site too, are basically characterized by large numbers of close relatives. And what we also found was that sites with high levels of relatedness also had high levels of inbreeding. And this means that these closely related individuals are actually mating with one another. And this might have implications because inbreeding is generally known to be detrimental to fitness, so it can reduce fertility and survival. So how can we explain this variation across sites? Well, um, what we did is we expressed diversity as the number of genets per sporocarp, and then we looked for a relationship between diversity and woodland age. And we found a highly significant negative correlation that explains about 70% of the total variance in diversity. And what's interesting to note here is that um, the highly diverse site with many closely related genets is actually the youngest site with an estimated age of around 23 years. And this highly productive site was around three times older. So to summarize the first part, I guess one of my take-home messages is that all sites are not equal. There's a lot of variation among sites in both the diversity and the productivity of individual genets. Especially in young sites, we found evidence for high levels of relatedness as well as inbreeding. And we did find that our results supported previous studies in that the diversity declines with woodland age. And one possible explanation is that inbred genets may not be surviving as long as outbred genets. And if this is the case, then actually natural selection will favor the offspring of um, individuals that are dispersed from a long distance away. And this will tend to undermine population structure on a large scale. So briefly, I, I described the project that we've recently had funded. And the aim of the project is to shed light on the population structure and the genetic diversity of Boletus edulis. And specifically, we want to better understand the processes of dispersal, and we want to understand how competition and natural selection shape maturing populations. And our approach is to sequence whole genomes of entire populations of mushrooms that have been followed systematically over many years. And we hope thereby to elucidate some key ecological and evolutionary processes. And we'll do this using existing sample sets. So we now have 28 sites around Bielefeld, monitored for up to seven years. And my colleague Bill Amos in Cambridge has four sites that have been monitored for 13 years. And these include a military training area. So this is an area that is closed to the public. It provides a large tract of continuous and pristine habitat that has not been hunted for many, many years, if at all. We've gathered over 1,600 samples. Most of those are GPS tagged. 
and the spatial scale of the study spans from a few centimeters to hundreds of kilometers. And we've systematically sampled both sites as well as individuals under specific trees within sites. First of all, we want to understand more about local recruitment. And the key question here is how far do the spores disperse? Based on the results of the pilot study, we think that most spores recruit locally, but it's possible that local adaptation to specific host trees could introduce biases. And basically, the approach is to incorporate many more sporocarps under different tree species from many more sites, and we use advanced genomic methods to reconstruct pedigrees for these sites. So we want to learn exactly how individuals are related, and this will allow us to determine how dispersal events took place. And so we hope to be able to replicate our original study, to generalize it across different host trees and locations, and to gain more detailed insights. Second, we want to understand better the selective forces that lead to the loss of diversity in aging woodlands. One hypothesis here is that the longevity of individual genets is not related to genotype, with, for instance, um, initial colonizers of a site having an advantage over latecomers. But it's also possible, as I mentioned before, that selection may favor outbred individuals. And here the approach is to apply a mark recapture analysis to estimate longevity while incorporating variation in the recapture probabilities and to combine this with the genomic inference of individual inbreeding levels. And finally, we want to know whether host specialization could be a route to speciation. And there are two possible extremes here. So the first is that Bolita sedulis is broken down into different genetically distinct and adapted host races, which basically um, go with the different tree species, at the other end of the spectrum, it could be that Bolita sedulis is a true generalist and shows no tendency for local adaptation or speciation. And our approach will be to systematically and repeatedly sample sporocarps from different host tree species and to use genomic approaches to test for signatures of local adaptation and genomic divergence. So I come near the end of my talk and one thing I've increasingly realized over the years is that many of these parameters that I'm interested in, in estimating like dispersal and survival might be influenced by mushroom hunting. So I want to briefly speculate on this question. So mushroom hunting is a beautiful activity. I can speak from personal experience and this is my son Benjamin. He loves mushroom hunting too. And the Italians call mushroom hunting the quiet hunt, which I think summarizes it really well for me. So mushroom hunting provides us this opportunity to commune with nature, to connect with our basic hunter-gatherer instincts. And of course, all of these mushrooms that we collect can form the basis of memorable meals. But as in all things in life, a balance has to be struck. And possibly this might be going a little bit too far. So I want to speculate on the possible effects of harvesting. And I'll emphasize that this is pure speculation because we have no idea. There are some possible negative effects. One might be that if we remove too much biomass from an individual, it might reduce its survival probability. This might not be important for large and well-established genets, but it might be important for newly established and small genets. Also, the process of trampling might uh, reduce the survival probability. In addition, certainly in Bielefeld, a common practice is to pick the tiniest, tiniest mushrooms, I mean, unbelievably small, and to stuff them into plastic bags and take them off home. And practices like this will tend to reduce dispersal. They'll shift the balance towards local dispersal. And that might result in more inbreeding. But there might be pos possible positive effects as well. So I think that appropriate harvesting of mushrooms of the right size in combination with the use of baskets, might actually increase diversity by facilitating 
the dispersal of spores. Here are some possible ways we could look at this. So the first one would be to look at concordance between spatial patterns of the harvesting pressure and patterns of genetic diversity. The second is that we could use genetic tracking to monitor the fates of individual mushrooms. So I could envisage that, for instance, we have a, a, a basket of mushrooms here. We could take a small sample from each mushroom. We could genotype it. And over many baskets, we could get an impression of how hunting effort is distributed across different individual genets. And in principle, we can um, find the correspondence between these genets and the places in the landscape where they were actually collected from. And finally, I think that with replicated plots, with and without harvesting, or with different harvesting practices, we could gain some causal insights into how harvesting might affect uh, these key processes of dispersal and survival. So I'd just like to acknowledge this team of international experts, including Fernando, um, who are uh, participating in this project. And I'd like to thank the German Science Foundation for funding. And um, I'd like to thank you all for listening. And I would be happy to take any questions that you might have. <laughs>